There is so much going on here at church these days. I mean, I, we have church Sunday mornings, home groups Sunday nights. Sometimes we have different things Sunday nights. We have a gym night coming up next month. We have Fish Out of Water concert coming up the month after the worship night. We have, uh, and during the week, I mean, Monday night, there's something going on here. What's going on here Monday nights? So then Tuesday nights, we have women's Bible study. And then on Wednesday nights, we have youth and young adults. On Thursday nights, we have prayer. Then you can go to karate and beat somebody up. I thought, actually, we should do that backwards and have karate first, then prayer, so we could pray for healing. Um, but there's always something going on in men's group on Saturday mornings. So it's a busy place. And uh, if you're not plugged in or involved in one of these things, I encourage you to, to, to be there. And um, looking forward to tonight's home group at our house. We had this a packed house last time. And... Just looking forward to just some good fellowship, amen? It's always good to hang out and eat some food and, and share what good things God is doing. Well, we're in our series in Genesis, and we're encountering Genesis chapter 4 today. <clears throat> As we've gone through the creation week and had some amazing things relate to us scientifically about the earth and the age of the earth and some evidence of a young earth, <coughs> and the overwhelming evidence for different parts of creation, not let alone that there is um, no measurable way that uh, science has found to age things accurately, as we've seen in the video series and different other things. And now that they're finding collagen and dinosaur bones, that shouldn't even be possible. Um, so, I mean, it's an amazing thing to realize that God put everything together. God put together, as we've learned, we saw last week, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden and all the, the things that were going on there and the original sin and the week before. And this week we encounter their children. So I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, it's uh, on the screen behind me. Genesis 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Now, Jewish tradition says that because of the long age, Adam lived 930 years, Adam and Eve were uh, before the great deluge. As we saw in the, the science uh, classes that we took here, the, uh, the environment, the perfect environment, the covering, the, uh, the, the shield of water vapor in the atmosphere that stops certain uh, uh, radiation from coming in and shortening life. The sun is what kills us, among other things today. But um, these people lived a long time. Immeasurable years, just as a day was formed a day in the original, is a day today. So we know uh, this is true. So 930 years, it's estimated that Eve could have had more than 60 children. Now, could you imagine that? Next week, we're going to be getting into, uh, you know, the wives of uh, some of these uh, uh, Cain and Seth and these people. But mind you, we know that he was 930 years old, and we learned in creation series the conditions of the earth were different, and and the, the total climate was almost identical, and the harmful parts of the sun radiation blocked, and all of this stuff. But people's physical bodies, as we have seen, were more perfect in the beginning. God made everything very good. It was perfect. And then sin comes in, and, and the big difference between the evolutionary ideas and the ideas that we have today is evolutionary believes the idea is that we're getting greater and higher, escalating to a utopia, uh, and, and getting to a better place of existence and our bodies are getting better and all of these things when science just says the opposite that there are more and more mistakes as they're called in the the gene pool as we go on with time different things are happening and this is because as the bible says that jesus is coming back again he is coming back for his people and he is going to make everything new all over again. So they had physical stamina, they had beauty, they had health and longevity, and, and God's command, of course, to multiply. And so everything is perfect. Life is long. Adam and Eve are having children, and the first two they have is recorded by Moses in Scripture here, um, um, Cain and Abel. And this time, a long time ago, if you think about it, Adam, 930 years, lived nearly one-sixth of the total years that we know from the beginning of creation till today. So 6,000 years, 4,000 years of biblical history and content until 2,000 years from then until now gives about 6,000 years. And so we have this, this, this uh, genealogy, if you will, from the time of Adam and Noah. Noah was born only 216 years after um, Adam dies. 
So here comes Noah, and Moses was born 800 years after Noah died. So if you think about it, it really hasn't been that long in terms of what we know today. I mean, 80 years, 90 years, and Emily, Emily was, what, 95? I think she had, was just going to turn 95, I think, the next day. Um, and she died right before she turned 95, a blessed soul that we loved here in our church and, and went home to be with Jesus. Praise God for that. And uh, she's with him. But the, that's, she lived a good long life. I mean, she had stories. <laughs> she had stories. And so um, you can imagine only 216 years after Adam died, Moses came along. And only 800 years after that, um, Noah dies. And if you think about it, since Cain and Abel were born, if you consider the literal six-day creation along with the full extent of all the history, there's about 600 years between Abraham and King David in the route 922 BC. And it was only 600 years after that that the rise of power of Alexander the Great came along and, and conquered the world, if you will, and another 300 years from then, from Alexander the Great, Till Jesus came, and in between the Old and New Testament was the rise and power of Alexander the Great. There's 400 years between the Old and New Testament, called the silent years. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along. Jesus came along 300 years after that, and, and Nero, of course, right there after Jesus' death uh, in 476 AD is when 470-something years later, the barbarians came in and overthrew the Roman Empire, and then the world kind of delves into the Dark Ages, and we have historical accounts of all kinds of things from the rise of the um, Oriental Empires, which also include uh, uh, descriptive art of a great flood that covered the whole earth. We're going to be looking at that when we get into it. Noah's got full of good stuff. So I mean, it really hasn't been that long till, and then was a, you know, another thousand years. A Columbus uh, landed, you know, in in um, San Salvador, expected to greet the Chinese emperor, but instead was greeted by by native South America South Americans. And the and the Mayflower landed at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock um, in 1620. America signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and the rest they say is history. And so here we are. When we look at this from the beginning of time to now, we really look at the genealogies and the way it goes. It really hasn't been that long. It really hasn't been that long at all. The creation of technology and stuff makes us sometimes think that we're smarter than previous generations, but you know, it's pretty apparent that in many ways we are not. Let's move along. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, it says, In the course of time came brought to the Lord offering the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of flock of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire, uh, its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. It seems very likely that Cain was born right when they were expelled from the garden. So Adam and Eve had Cain um, right as they're getting outside the garden here and, and, and Abel maybe a year later or so. And so these guys were, you know, brothers. And you can see that they already understand the significance of blood sacrifice. It's already understood by them. You remember this last week we talked about the original sin and God shed the first blood. He killed the first animals and made a covering for their nakedness. So because of that symbolism of covering, the Bible uh, says that God establishes this, that the covenant with them is a blood sacrifice. So every time they shed blood and make a sacrifice, it represents the covering of their sin. And so God does this, and it's already in their understanding, but Cain doesn't, under, he doesn't bring the best offering he could. He brings kind of his, uh, what he wants to rather, and what he works for rather than what God requires. And the significance of this is, is well known. So it says also in the text, which I find interesting, it says in the course of time. It actually means at the end day. It means the last day of the week. It means the Sabbath. So he brought to a place, because it says brought, so they brought to a place, a specific place, in a specific time for their offering, much like we do in church today. We came today at the specific time, the specific place. We've had a class. We drank coffee together. We've sang songs. We've prayed for one another. Uh, we've prayed for different needs. And here we are 
um, listening to uh, some guy ramble on. So what that was, though, for them was they went to a place of bringing to a place, a specific place, their offering. And so God gives tremendous insight into this. And the offering was a big thing. And there's some things, if you're following along in your outline that we have here. So the offering was an act of worship, number one. It was an act of worship. When we worship, what are we doing? Uh, more than singing songs, hopefully. You know, we started off the service by reading Psalm 96 where it says, I will sing a new song. In other words, there's something new that God has done in me. He's, he's brought me new life, and so I'm going to sing a song even though I might have known the song. It means something new to me today. It means something new when you turn to your spouse every morning and you say, I love you because it's a new day. They knew yesterday, but today you remind them of the same thing, but yet it's a new day. The same with God. The same with him, that we tell him and we thank him and we praise him and we worship him. And Abel was able to bring the very best of what he had. The very best of what he had. And this is echoed by Jesus who said, uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now each one of these means something so significant. Have you ever really thought about worship? I mean, we all come into church and we sing this, you know, How great is our God, sing with me. And we get, maybe we can get lost in the moment, you know. There's some songs that just move me. I mean, aren't, aren't you moved by some songs? Every time I hear, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light, I'm moved. And the rocket's red glare, the bones. I mean, it moves me, right? If I go to a game and they sing that song and we're all standing there and, and uh, it just, uh, you know, it just resonates with the crowd and everybody's moved by the fact that we're Americans, <laughs> God, and we're excited, you know, it's, it's a great thing. But God says this is something that's similar but somewhat different because worship is for God. Sometimes we come into the God's house and we believe, well, worship is for us. And although the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people, the worship is for God. When we bring our best to God and we worship Him, we worship Him with our, with our singing, with the echoing the Bible, the psalmist says over and over again, I will come into your sanctuary, I will bless your name, I will extol you, I will lift you high by singing praises to your name. And it's, it's, it's for God. I heard somebody say recently that it's, worship is really for us. We're, and it's not. And, and I understand the misunderstanding and what the person was trying to clarify, but worship is for God. The worship is for God. Worship, Jesus says, with all your heart. Now, he gives us these four things that are very important, and the heart is important because that love is defined by genuine affection for him. That kind of love is expressed by genuine affection. Now, when you have affection for someone, you show it, right? When you have affection for somebody, you give them a, a hug or a kiss, or you, you greet them with, with fondness and kindness, you shake their hand, you do something to, to connect with them on a very affectionate level. And, and when you're married, you connect on an affectionate level. When you have friends that you really love, you connect on an affectionate level. Guys are different this way. I love what one comedian puts it. Guys can, you know, they can have friends forever. And, and, and uh, you know, they see each other. Guys have an average of three friends, good friends their whole life. And women have 13 on an average. So there's a big difference. And women have friends. And, and the guy... Guys can, you know, we don't react like women do when they react. Women, when they see somebody, uh, when a guy has seen somebody he hasn't seen for every, hey, what's up, how's it going, man? Yeah. I mean, he walks out of the desert after 40 days and you, you know, hey, what's up? A woman sees somebody, she, another woman she hasn't seen for five minutes. You know, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Ah! Anyway, we show great affection, right? I showed a great, I show affection for my boys. I love them. My wife, I love her. And your, our desire, though, for the Lord is to bring him that sacrifice of affection. Because God knows that that love with all your heart is defined by that affection you're expressing. He wants you to be affectionate. The psalmist says so many expressions of affection. I will clap my hands. I will sing. I will rejoice. I will play the stringed instrument loud. I'll crash on the cymbals loud. I'm going to show a lot of affection. I'm going to do something that makes some noise. I'm going to express to him. And sometimes we will get just uh, uh, enamored by the Lord. And we might cry. We might just be amazed by him. And we might weep. Uh, we're, we're just in awe of him. And so that affection comes out. So loving the Lord your God with all your heart, and he says with all your soul. 
And this is the important part because this is where our character flows from. This is what makes you, you, your decisions, your determinations to bring him that offering, the sacrifices of character, the sacrifices of uh, punctuality, the sacrifices of uh, compassion and concern for others, the sacrifices of all those things the Bible says that Christians should aspire to. And there's a lot of them. When we think about our character, it's what actually that we do when no one is looking that really defines that part of us. That character is extremely important. So with all of our soul means the way that we're actually doing things. And it says, with all your mind, a love for God that is convinced of his ways and his promises. I am 100% convinced that Jesus is God. I am 100% convinced beyond the shadow of doubt that he created everything and that he loves me. I am uh, convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus died on the cross and gave a great sacrifice so that I could know him and have a personal relationship with him. I am 100% convinced of that in my mind. I have rehearsed the theological arguments. I have gone over the material. I have memorized the scriptures to try to make the point. I have, I have come to that perspective. I have come to that agreement in my mind that in my mind I am convinced of his love. And then, I, then it says to love him with all your strength. How our love is acted out. How our love is lived out loud. Our works and our calling and all of those things and our resources. Your giving of sacrifice. Your, the picking of your very best with your hands and giving it to God. The big three values that make up a person. Three things that make up a person. Your time, your money, and your affection. And this all translates into the parts of our lives that make us human, and the best of what we have of those big three belongs to God. The best of our time, the best of our money or resources, and the best of our affection. That's why God has us in Scripture give, us, give Him these things. And those that understand the joy of giving those things understand that He has blessed us in more ways than we can count. That He provides and He gives away. If you have... If you haven't ever given of your time, you haven't ever tithed and given of your money or, or given to someone else in some way in great need or uh, shown your affection to those who are hurting, I challenge you to give that because God, the Bible says that God will give more pressed down, shaken together, already refined into your lap. He will just give it to you, pour it right out. The offering was an act, the second thing of faith in God as provider. So Hebrews 11.4 tells us, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So when you and I give our time to serve someone in Jesus' name, when we give our resources or money uh, or other resources to God's house or, or to help others, and we work in the ministry when we give our affections through our worship, our prayer, our adoration, and our giving, we're telling God that we are trusting him above anything else in this world. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying that Abel was able to trust God more than any other resource or any other thing on this earth. He brought his very best to God. And, and so it's, it's a really important thing that, that God, when he looks at our heart, that he knows what's going on. We can't hide from him. That our heart is really saying, God, I really love you. With all of my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, you are my provider. And the right offering, the next one, is really what God was looking for. He was looking at Cain and Abel, and Abel brought the right offering, and Cain didn't bring the right offering, but yet God was still encouraging Cain. Notice the words, even though Cain brought the right thing and he got angry, God says, hey, you know, if you do what's right, I'm going to accept you. You'll be accepted. Just do what's right. No, you want to do what's right. I want to do what's right for you. Brian Duncan. Anybody know Brian Duncan? Sweet comfort man? Yeah, that's the stuff I'm talking about. You know, that's the good stuff. Come on. Anyway, the right offering is what he's looking for. I might have a story I heard about an old time preacher in New York. He had a beautiful grandfather clock in his office. People would come in and they would comment, oh man, that is a gorgeous clock. Look at the intricacies of the, of the woodworking and all the things that went into it. But it didn't work. <laughs> and I always wondered, why does this clock work? You know, this clock is beautiful. It's ornate. He says, he always said, don't blame the hands. The trouble lies much deeper. How true that is. You know, God doesn't look just as our outward expression. 
if you're a giver and maybe you give a lot or you serve a lot or you give a lot of time, God is really looking at our heart, isn't he? He really is looking at much deeper than just the hands. He's looking deep inside. Adam and Eve's sin resulted in the death of an animal, which eventually led to the, the old covenant, which was established and all of this stuff. And so that blood also represented, of course, as we saw, Jesus' shed blood. Hebrews chapter, chapters 9 and 10 tells us that Jesus became that ultimate final sacrifice so that no sacrifice of animals is required any longer. So because of that, God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice because it was an animal that could be sacrificed, the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. But Cain's sacrifice was because of the work of his hands. It was something that Cain could perform. It was something that he could do. And so because he brought his performance, he brought his works, it meant nothing for salvation. The sacrifices of God are recognizing that I have nothing in myself to save myself. People... All the time, like I'm reminded of uh, uh, Jimmy, who came, and him, him and his wife, Teresa, they were a wonderful couple. Remember them? They had a little boy named Jimmy Jr. And uh, they came, and his, his whole life, he was a big guy and, and retiring from the military, and, and a pastor came up to him and told him, you know, you're just, you're just chasing all this stuff and hoping to bring satisfaction. God's calling you to run to him, and he ran to him. He came to him, and God saved him. And, of course, we knew him for a while until they moved away to Michigan. And, and um, he understood then that no longer was it the things that he could do to perform to try to be good. You can't be good enough for God to love you. It's not possible. It's impossible. It's impossible. So the blood equals God's intervention. The fruits and veggies equals works. Your work and my work is not enough. It's, it's not by the work that we do. It's by the work of God alone. So worship is about recognizing what God has done. It's all about him. Genesis chapter 4, moving on now. The Bible says, Cain spake to, his, to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, and Abel, and his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Pretty flippant answer. I don't know where he's at. Am I my brother's keeper? I mean, he's being pretty bold, isn't he? He's like saying, dude, God, you don't know? Well, how, how? he knew that God knew, but yet God is testing him. He's trying him. It's pretty flippant. Obviously, he doesn't have much regard for Abel or God. The way that he speaks, he disregarded the instruction for sacrifice. He was hostile toward God. He couldn't kill God, so he kills his brother. He even says this very sarcastic thing, knowing his brother kept sheep, he says, am I my brother's keeper? He puts it in that perspective. And earlier we read that he was angry. And Abel's sacrifice was acceptable, not because it was an animal or even because it was the best of what he had, not even because it was a, uh, because of Abel's zealous heart for God. It was because his sacrifice was obedient. God preferred Abel's sacrifice because it was obedient. And, and he liked meat. It's not because he liked meat more than vegetables. I mean, I like meat more than vegetables. I mean, just look at me, right? You understand that. Uh, I'd rather have a good steak any day than, you know, a bunch of collard greens. And, you, yeah, you know, for those of you guys that like that stuff, more power to you. God bless you. There are, there are, there are uh, some restaurants that have tried to accommodate. There's a few still alive in California to accommodate only the person who eats the vegetables. And i got to tell you, most of them that open up close their doors. Because we are meat eaters. I'm sorry for you vegans out there. But you know, if you come over to my house, I'm going to offer you a good steak. I'm just, I would never do that, actually. I offend you, but I, you know, for all you vegans, praise God for steak. Anyway, that's all I have to say. So, so Abel comes and he brings his firstborn, the best of his flock. And the Bible says that Cain brought some of his produce. It's almost as if Cain... Cain's worship, his offering, didn't come from his best like Abel, but rather just his leftovers. And God deserves more than our leftovers. You know, there's this thing my mom used to do years ago, and, and we loved it. I don't know what she did. And she would make this stuff called Indian bread, but she would also make this stuff called leftovers and hash. How many have had leftovers and hash? 
I gotta tell you, there's no real ingredient for this or recipe. You just go in the fridge and you find the leftovers, the, some potatoes and a little bit of ham pieces, and, and you put it in a skillet and you fry it up all together with whatever's left. And you put a little seasoning on it and you eat it. And it's called leftovers and hash. And some of the best meals I've ever had have been leftovers and hash. But God's looking for the very best. I mean, I would rather go to Black Angus any day and have a great steak than just a bunch of leftovers from the fridge. I mean, they cook it, it comes out just like you want it, and, and uh, then the Applebee's, they make a great steak. I'm, uh, it's almost lunchtime, I'm starting to start to smell the food that's going to be cooking downstairs in a little bit. The food is, del food is just delicious. I mean, why did God make it so good? Because he knew we would like it, right? And so he, this, is, this is just the way that it was. And when we think about his sacrifice, he brought the best of what he had and, and Cain seems very flippant. He's bringing just kind of God whatever. Everything, you know, I'm just going to take out what I got in the fridge here, God. And I'm going to give you kind of what's left over and, and hope you enjoy this kind of worship, God. I really thank you for it. So, you know, some might say, I don't see anything wrong with what Cain did. But Jude, verse 11, says that the church has been plagued with the fact that they have gone, as Jude 11 says, quote, in the way of Cain. When Cain brought his offering to God, he didn't come by faith. He came on his own with his own work, his own sacrifice, his own expectation of church, his own expectation of worship, his expectation of what songs we were going to sing, his expectation of what sermon was going to preach, his expectation of what church was going to be like, his expectation. So Cain brings all of his expectations of what worship really is all about. And God says, hey, I don't want your leftovers. I want what I require. I don't just want what you think is right. I want what I think is right because I'm God. And what you think in this case really doesn't matter a whole lot because I'm God, the creator of all things universe, who puts your little speck in the ground in the sand and I love you more than you can know and yet you bring me your leftovers. You bring me your leftovers. How many times do we come into God's house and we just bring them our leftovers and hash? We say, God, here's a little bit of, of, of prayer this week off my fridge. Here's a little bit of compassion I had in somebody this week. Here's a little bit of this understanding that you gave your life for me entirely. Here's a little bit of this uh, tithe and offering I'm going to give. Here's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we say, oh, it's good enough. Instead of looking at God and saying, God, I'm really giving you everything. God, I'm giving you 100%. I'm not giving you my leftovers and hash. I'm giving you the best. And the Bible says that they required, the, the, when the law finally came around, it hadn't been established yet, they were to cut out the fat portions. You know, when you cook a steak or you cook burgers on the grill, the thing that smells really good is the fat. Did you know that? I mean, the steak and the meat's delicious. You can see that make it good. But the thing in a good burger is that, that makes it juicy and stuff is actually the fat. We might not want to hear that, if you're going for a burger at Red Robin after church today. But i got to tell you, the part that smells good is the fat. And the, the law eventually set up where God wanted those fat portions sacrificed and burned as a sweet-smelling savor to him. Now, when I think about my leftovers in my life, there's a lot of things. Sometimes I come into God's house with just my leftovers. There's been a number of times where I've told God, God, I don't want to preach today. Can you just... You know, let lightning zap me or something. Take me away, Calgon. I'm finished, you know. Uh, can we do something different? Maybe we'll just show video in church. I mean, I know churches that are doing that now. Let's just watch movies. Uh, the Avengers is out. Let's watch, you know. I like when the Hulk gets real mad and crunches people. That'll be fun in church, God. I just want to give you my leftovers. I don't want to preach. I don't want to talk about your great love. I'm just not feeling it. That's the honest to goodness answer. But see, friends, if... It were those feelings and those times, those feelings and those times and those things are to be prayed through. When you and I come into God's house, we need to be ready to give, to give in our worship and expression and love for Him. The Bible says, come before the Lord with singing, clap, sing to Him a new song, rejoice before the Lord. All those expressions of worship that seem to get cut out of our minds. God, I don't want to do that. God, I'm giving you the very best of my tithes and offerings. I'm giving you because I recognize that you're going to take better care of me than my own ability to care for my checkbook is. Ouch, we don't like that one. But the promises of God are true. Do we bring God our leftovers and hash? You know, Cain's sacrifice denies that man is separated from God because of sin. He acted like everything was okay because he's bringing his leftovers and hash. 
And friends, things are not right with us. We are not born children of God. We have to be born again children of God. Our spirit has to be renewed. And man, I'm so grateful for the day when God's going to say, take us away and I'm going to be given a new body. I mean, I was playing basketball yesterday with the boys again. And uh, I won, of course. I'm so good. But I've recognized that I've gotten older in my 46 years of life. I mean, I've got video. Uh, Mom's got video of me playing basketball with my big old hair flopping back and forth, drunk in the basketball and all this stuff. And, and I couldn't even touch the rim yesterday. I have sunk to a new low of depression. I have recognized that I no longer can jump. I not only am white and can't jump, I just can't jump. Still got some of the moves, but the body just doesn't travel as far as it used to. And once again this morning, I'm sore. From the little bit of basketball that we played, I'm sore. But I still won. Learn to play smarter, not harder, right? Anybody over 40 say amen. Amen. Come on, do better than that. Amen? Amen. <laughs> the Cain's offering suggested that his flesh, his ability was good enough. What he could produce was good enough, and God says no. Cain's offering also suggests that man can offer his works to God, and that would be enough. Cain's response is, is, is obvious that, that he no longer viewed God as his loving father but rather as an ungrateful, unavailable, and empty God. But God's response to Cain not only shows us how much that he loves him, but that he cares deeply for the direction of his life. God desires that kind of love from his kids because it is that worship that Scripture says blesses his heart. That when we come to God and we really have that attitude that we are really loving him, the Bible says it blesses his heart. This is the heart of our Heavenly Father. I have kids, and I, I love it when my boys do things for me. I'm blessed. When they were younger, they would say, Daddy, I want to be just like you. That's changed somewhat, but that made me happy. When they act like a mature young men or do kind things for others, I'm blessed because I'm their dad. And What really blesses me, though, is that when I tell them to do something and they just do it. And i got to tell you, they are pretty good about that. They are. Anytime I send them somewhere to work with somebody for something, they said, you know, your boys, they just do what they're told. Well, they should from an adult. Otherwise, they meet the, 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 the justifier at home. It's a wood, well, you get the idea. <laughs> Haven't had to use it in years because they understand that. It's been in them since they were tiny. So to obey is better than sacrifice. My son Justin preached on Wednesday night, and he used this exact scripture. Powerful message to the young people. They were lingering at the altars for way past the normal time because I think there was an understanding there that God desires our obedience more than our sacrifice of worship. So the worship to God had to be obedience. Cain's sin was big, and I must hurry along or we're not going to beat the Baptist to the buffet. So the presence of sin disrupts relationships. The presence of sin disrupts, divides nations. It separates us from God. And in the, the life of the human family, the consequences of rebellion against God are always seen. It breaks up the family. It destroys relationships. And the sin of disobedience and disbelief hurt Adam and Eve's relationship with their creator and, and caused them to live apart from him. And later, Cain becomes so angry that he murders his brother Abel. And that pattern from God, that, that jealousy, hatred, and violence continues today. So here's some of his sin. <clears throat> Number one, insincere worship, which we spent most of our time talking about. And it's at this point we can understand why blood was so important. But Cain decided that it wasn't. So my question, I guess, for us is, do you have insincere worship? The second sin of Cain was jealousy and envy. And these are two peas in a pod, because I, I wish my sacrifice was like Abel's. And then there's the, the acceptance that Abel got. I want that. So envy starts with wishful thinking. Jealousy ends it with wanting what someone else has. We do this today at uh, church. I wish I was as wonderful a Christian as this person. Or, or the world thinks in these t terms all the time, actually, that oh, <clears throat> why I deserve more. They have it. 
so I can just take it from them. His other sin was misdirected anger. <clears throat> if there was anyone that Cain really should have been angry with, it should have been Adam or God, the serpent, name him. I mean, he should have been more angry with his father for getting them expelled from the garden. <clears throat> now he's had to learn a whole new world of doing stuff. And so what happens here all of a sudden is that there's a separation from this place, this beautiful utopia. And because of that, all of a sudden, uh, Cain is, is learning a whole new lifestyle. Thorns among the, the produce of the land, all this kind of stuff. It's not something that he wanted ever to do, so really he should be angry at Adam. Or he should be angry at the serpent for tempting Eve or talking to her even. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. You know, anger, anger is a warning flag. Thanks, Jim. Anger is a warning flag. It's a, it's a sign that something's wrong with me. Something has been ignited in me. Someone's questioned my ability. Someone's questioned my toughness. Someone's questioned my resources. Someone's questioned me in some way. So I have a right to respond the way that I'm going to. I'm going to be angry. And so anger is this, this feeling, this red flag, really, for the believer that wants to understand self-control. It's a warning sign that my pride has been affected. Somehow I've been wrongfully accused or something has happened. And because of this situation, I'm angry. I'm upset. I didn't make the shot when I was playing in the basketball game and I got angry or something was taken from me or somebody doesn't trust me. And so we get angry. So anger is a warning flag. Warning flag. And it's very red. In anger comes that warning flag. What happens? The warning flag pops up like this red shirt, boom, right there. I'm angry. And what does it do then? It begins to list its rights. I am angry because I deserve to be treated better than this. I'm angry because I deserve that pay raise. I'm angry because she can fit into that dress and I can't. I'm angry because my brother did this to me. I'm angry because ugh, I'm just frustrated. I'm angry because I didn't make the grade, I didn't make the team. I'm angry because they got this job and, and I don't. I'm angry because everybody else has a job and I don't. Whatever we're angry about, we say we have a right to it. So we start listing our rights and then the thing that we need to understand is that we don't have any rights. Really, we live in America because we say well, we have a right and right to this and right to that and praise God for freedom. It does ensure those certain things. But the kind of rights we're talking about are rights that we, uh, that we build our anger on. That we come to a place where we begin to list, I have a right to be respected. I have a right to have dinner at 6 o'clock on the table ready when I get home. Oh, my lands, I've heard it all. So how do we defeat anger? Well, first of all, we've got to list our rights and we've got to give them to God. And then we need to understand that we're going to be tested those rights are going to be tested. So misdirected anger. His last thing, of course, is murder. And let's read Genesis chapter 4 and verse 11. And now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and wander on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now think about it. He's the one that's working the land. And now God's saying, you know, all the strength is not going to produce what you think it's going to produce anymore. That had to be real disappointing. Verse 14, Behold, you have driven me uh, today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Verse 15, God's act of mercy. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. There's a lot of interesting things about murder. In the Old Testament, it's established that when you murder, your life will be taken from you, the eye for an eye. Capital punishment, in other words. This is the way that it's going to be. This is the pattern. And, of course, it's carried through. Jesus affirms that this is still the case. 
in Matthew chapter 5 when he talks about judgment, but he goes even further because Jesus says that you're guilty of murder if you say to your brother, you stupid idiot. He uses the word fool there, but if we take a look at Brown Steyer's exact translation, it says that if you say to your brother in anger, you stupid idiot, he said, it's like you've murdered him. And you're going to be judged for that. Now, i got to think about the times that I've actually called somebody a stupid idiot. I think it's been a lot more than I would like to confess to you this morning. After all, I have a driver's license. <laughs> and I understand that there are a lot of SIs out there. So can I say that's a shortcut to saying stupid? I could just say SI, right? So this is the ultimate thing for us today. The principle Jesus is relaying in Matthew 5, read the whole chapter, it's powerful. He says, if any man, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I tell you, if any man looks at a woman and lusts after her, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. I mean, I've been in the checkout lines in the grocery store and seen more than I wanted. <clears throat> or I should have. Maybe not that I wanted, but that I should have. The whole idea that Jesus says, if you say to someone in anger, you stupid idiot, I wish you were dead, is saying and doing the same thing as murder in your heart. And Jesus says, in other words, it's impossible for you to live perfectly. Amen. You need my grace. Amen. Jesus died to fulfill the righteous rules of the old covenant so that when we feel those things and those things come into our life, he calls us to turn to him in repentance. That's why the existence of the church. That's why we gather together. That's why we have these altars. Well, that's why we have men's groups and women's groups and prayer groups. And all throughout the week is that, that we meet together and we pray and we seek God. And we say, God, I want to grow, so I need you to work this out of me. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Being a Christian is not a casual experience of gathering together in church just to be around a few people who might be on fire for God. It's God calling us to not give him our leftovers and hash anymore. It's about saying, God, I'm giving you everything. Jesus makes it so clear. He goes on to say in Matthew that you've got to come clean with this. You've got to confess your sin. You know, <clears throat> my final points here are based on this statement. God will do whatever is necessary to get the root of our sin. He will. Number one, God has always had a way of restoring what we break. He always has a way. You know, there are a lot of things that we break in life. We break relationships, most importantly. We break a relationship with him and with those around us. We break um, our finances. We break our bodies sometimes. And Cain now says he's hidden from the face of God, and that's exactly how we feel when we sin. And notice how God protects him. And why does God do it? Why does God protect Cain? Shouldn't he just strike him dead? He protects him as he does even wicked King Ahab and Jezebel in Scripture. Four times he slew and murdered his own children in the fire. And four times he cries out to God. And God forgives him. Why does God do that? Because God is the one who can deliver the punishment in, in the sentence. We can't. And God says to Cain, you know, because you've cried out and you're broken, I'm not going to let anyone touch you. I've heard people say this, oh man, I've blown it so much, God would never love me, he doesn't move in my life. I don't know if you heard the story I told it, my very first Sunday I ever came to Abundant Life, almost 20 years ago. There's a blonde, <clears throat> it's a man this time, it's not a woman. And this blonde guy gets a job painting lines on the road. And he's excited about this new job. So the first day he paints like, you know, a mile and a half. And, and the guy, the boss, comes back. He says, wow, you have done a great job. A mile and a half painting lines on the road in a day. That is a fantastic progress. You, you've done well. Well, the next day the boss came and he had only painted an eighth of a mile. And he said, well, maybe he's just having a bad day. So the boss came back the next day, and he had only painted a sixteenth of a mile. And the boss came back the next day, and he only painted two feet. Two feet. I mean, two feet. Twenty-four inches. And the boss said, you know, you started out really great, man. I, I appreciated your work, and even though you're blonde, I hired you. 
Uh, he said, what's the deal? The first day you did great, second, not great, and third, terrible, and today is awful. What happened? And the guy looked at him with a dumbfounded look on his face with his yellow paintbrush in hand, mystified at the question. He said, well, every day I get further from the bucket. Uh, you blonde ones, you got that yet? <laughs> Thank God for brunettes. I don't know, I'm just kidding. Every day I get further from the bucket. Well, I wonder if our relationship with God is that way. In fact, I know that it is. We start out all really on fire, right close to that, doing exactly and planning exactly what we want. And after a while, we begin walking further away from the Lord and further away from the Lord, although he has never moved, he's never changed. He's not something that we keep there. We take him with us wherever we go. God always has a way of restoring what we break. He always has a way of coming through. It's our job to stay close to him, to stay close to his presence. Isaiah 61.3 says, To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty from ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. Have you ever felt like that? Mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's a spiritual battle going on there. That they might be called the trees of the righteous, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Glorified in God's garden. The second thing, and let's move along. Our deeper motive is what God will go after. He's going to dig it up. God knew something else was going on with Cain, and more than just the way that Cain lashed out, it was deep down, it was inside. Acting out of sin is only the symptom. The stuff we see on the outside people doing is only the outside. There's something deeper. James 4, 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire to battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but can't have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasure. Talk about fights and quarrels coming from unhealthy desires. It's, that's a big thing. There's a... <clears throat> There's a confession I have to make. Years ago, we lived uh, by the Blueberry Park, and we had a neighbor behind us. And all night, they were having this party, and I had to get up super early and go to work. <clears throat> <clears throat> so they had this party, and my neighbor uh, next to me, Mr. Jimmy, he even called the police. And the police came over, and they turned it down about 2 in the morning and turned it back on again after the police were gone. And it was just, I mean, it was horrible. <clears throat> So I did something I probably shouldn't have. Got out my generator and some skill saws, a bunch of tools, <laughs> right next to the fence, 4.30 in the morning when they're in their sleeping it off stage. Started my loud generator, pointed it right at the back window of their house, got my saw out and my nail gun, not the nail gun, not my Hitachi, I got out the pass load that takes the, the gas engine in it that goes boom, 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 like that. And I started shooting nails in the floor of my shed that didn't need any more nails. And it was noisy, it was loud, it was horrible. Mm, felt good. I got back inside, took a shower, and Pam said, do you feel better? Not really. <laughs> you know, God's going to go after our motive. He's going to go, There's these, those were the only symptoms of a deep-seated frustration I had with many things in life at the time. God is more concerned about what is in our heart than, is, than he is how we behave. You know, God's will, will and his best for you, he will always act in his best for your life no matter how well you behave. He always knows what to do. The real issue James deals with here is the motive of our hearts. It's the same with Cain. Proverbs 16.2 says, All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but the motives are weighed by the Lord. Friends, don't ever be surprised by your circumstances in life because trouble or opportunities that God will allow in your life, they are simply a testing ground of your soul. The second thing here is the source of wrong motives comes from giving ourselves too much credit. Psalm 36.2, For in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect his own sin. 
In other words, I've told myself I'm so good and I'm so perfect and I don't need Jesus or I don't need God. I've told myself that I'm getting by just fine that he doesn't even know he has sin because he's filled himself with a bill of lies. This is the role of an atheist. The Bible says God doesn't believe in atheists. Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Finally, sin's mark is there to remind us of the grace of God. I don't know what this mark was on Cain, but somehow the Bible says that God marked him so that no one would touch him. There's some speculation about what the mark is, but God protects Cain. Up to this point, there has been given no law, so, be, so Adam's murder of Cain isn't enforced under any reinforcement because of transgression of the law, because there is no law given yet about murder. But his sin is that he did not bring the offering his entire life, the best of what he had to God. The deep thing that was inside of him was that he didn't really care or didn't want to invest what was necessary. And friends, you and I have walked through life, and because there's been many times we haven't invested what God really desires from us, we have suffered scars. We've suffered brokenness in relationships. We've suffered humility and pain. And some of us, all of us, carry our scars to this day. And what is the matter with us that we always look at them and we always look at those scars with great addiction and we like to think that, well, because this happened to me a long time ago, I'm always going to be this way. I'm always going to live this way. But you know what? The Bible talks 300 times, 300 times. It says, it calls sinners, sinners. But it only calls saints three times. And it always clarifies the saints or the holy or the righteous more than 200 times in Scripture, which means that there is no more excuses for you and I to say, I'm just a sinner. Friends, the Bible says he calls you his saints. And the reason that he can do that is not because you're so good, but because he is so good. The Bible tells us that by his grace, his grace is bigger than your failures. His grace is bigger than your addiction. His grace is richer than your poverty. His grace is more than you need or deserve. His grace is not like any other grace that can be given. His grace has more political power than Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, the Green Party, the Brown Party, the Pink Party. It doesn't matter. He's stronger than any military power. His grace gives more than Bill Gates could ever think about giving. His grace keeps on giving. You can't buy it. You're not good enough to earn it. His love pours out in abundance. And Scripture tells us that where there is a lot of sin, where there is a lot of Cain going on in our life, where there's a lot of wrong offering, where we're giving all of our best strength to the world and everything it has to offer, rather than God, the Bible says there is still more grace. Because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is verse 16 that says, And Cain, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Why did God lead Cain's example for us? Why scar Cain and let him leave? After all, sometimes we think God is so harsh because we see his word and we feel like uh, we're under, maybe some people feel sometimes like they're under his thumb. I've heard the people in the world say, well, that, that religion is just too, too many rules and you people in structured churches, you're, you're just insane. Going, what are you talking about? We're the blessed hypocrites of our generation. We're called saints. And so they see the hands of God as something that's ready to beat them down and hold a big stick in the sky because they failed. They've committed adultery or they're living a lifestyle that they know that your Bible wouldn't approve. And all the time they're looking at God's hands as things of giving spankings and discipline. And the Bible says his hands were bruised and bleeding and pierced, hanging on a cross. That's how much God loves us. Even though our Cain sin is huge, God still desires us more than anything. And I hope we hear that today, that God is a God of justice, but he's a God of grace. And if you live by the God of justice 100% of time, you'll never understand that he gives his grace. And if you live in his grace so much, all the time where you feel like you can do anything you want, you don't understand his justice. 
That's why God sent Cain away, because he's a just, gracious, loving father. Let's stand and pray about this, shall we? I'm going to ask our worship team to come. I'm just going to spend a minute. I know we're a couple minutes after already. I missed my mark. I preached longer than usual today. Inspired, I guess. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's power. Thank you for this crowd that's come out today. Thank you for those who may be watching online. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for our church family that gathers together like this to be encouraged in your word or rebuked. Thank you, Lord, for your rebuke. As a loving father would rebuke, thank you, Lord, for that. We would be remiss to say that we were ungrateful for it. Thank you all the more, Lord Jesus, for your grace that you give. So, Lord, I just thank you today for all of these things and give you praise. But, Lord, I want to pray further that this morning that we are sensitive to the direction of your Holy Spirit, that you are speaking to us to step out of our comfort zone and live a life of radical obedience to Jesus. It's much more than coming to church. It's much more than our leftovers and hash. It's the steak. It's the good stuff. It's what you desire and you've prepared for us, Lord. So, Lord, fill us with your spirit this morning. Speak to our hearts. Friends, in this congregation this morning as we've gathered, I want to ask you with, with all sincerity of your heart, being transparent before God, if you recognize that you've been giving God your leftovers and hash, and you know that, that he requires so much more, would you with me just begin to pray and ask him for his grace and forgiveness? And remember that one part of, of living that out loud is living that character that God's called us to live. So just right where we're standing, let's make this our altar. Would you come to the Lord and offer him not just your apology, but your sincere.